Sai Ram. Welcome to this Study Circle podcast from the Sri Satya Sai Media Center. Bhagwan Sri Satya Sai Baba has always encouraged devotees to delve into the message given by him through the practice of a study circle where a spiritual topic is chosen and each participant shares their point of view. And finally, important lessons are drawn therefrom. In this series, a small group of Swami students who are now serving in various institutions of Bhagwan participate to share their thoughts on Swami's message and how it can be applied in everyday life. Sai Ram, dear listeners, and welcome to Radio Sai Study Circle. In 1968, while addressing the delegates of the first World Conference of Sri Satya Sai Seva Organization, Swami said, Many people plead for a message from me. Well, my life is my message. And in this program, we are going to dwell and discuss on how to make our lives His message. We have with us now in the studio of Radio Sai, four former students of Swami's University who continue to serve their alma mater, Ame Deshpande, Sai Giridhar, and K.M. Ganesh. They are all research scholars. We also have Mr. G.S. Srirangarajan, who after serving for many years as a faculty member, is currently the controller of examinations. And he is the one who will be moderating this panel discussion. So, what are we going to discuss today? Let's get it straight from the moderator. Sir, all yours. Thank you, Vishu. Uh, hi, Amai, Giridhar, Ganesh. Sir, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. I'm sorry. Today, uh, you know, I was just wondering what to pick up for discussion. And what struck to me is those beautiful Chinnakatas of Swami. These are the very small stories, but such profound messages. And, uh, you know, as I was thinking, this particular story that has really struck me most came to my mind. It's about the monkey and the pot. You know, in, Swami says in the olden days, to catch monkeys in the forest, they used to have a pot with a narrow neck. And the pot would be filled with peanuts. Now the monkey puts its hand inside and clasps the nuts. (laughs) The monkey is able to put the hand inside, but the moment it clasps these nuts, it is not able to remove its hand because the neck of the pot is so narrow. It's a simple story, but then Swami draws wonderful messages from this. And if you really ruminate over this story, there are three messages which really come forth. And that's what I thought we should be discussing today. The first one is the delusion aspect. The monkey, Swami says, thinks that actually there is something inside the pot which is holding it back and it's therefore not able to escape and it literally falls prey to the hunters. Yeah, very true. It, it somehow gets deluded and all the time it thinks there is something else catching whereas actually it is the <laughs> monkey which is holding on to <laughs> the nuts. The second aspect which really comes forth is attachment. Why is the monkey not able to give up those nuts? Why is it greedy for so many nuts? After all, if it had held a few nuts, maybe the hand would have come out. But it wouldn't do that. And uh, the third one which follows from this is, how do you control your greed? As Swami says, place a ceiling on desires. That is very obvious. Right. So these are the three messages I thought we should discuss today. And starting with delusion, there's a wonderful story that comes to my mind. And this is what Ramana Maharishi writes in his book. He gives the example of a dog. You give it a dry bone, the dog keeps chewing on the dry bone. And eventually the gums of the dog start bleeding. And then the dog feels that this blood is coming from the bone and starts enjoying it at its own cost. (laughs) Now this is the heights to which, you know, a being can get deluded. And same example with the musk deer. Swami says the musk deer runs all around trying to find the source of the musk, which is but in its own navel. So why do you think our mind, as Swami says, is so deluding? What do you feel, Amai? Very, very beautifully put, sir. In fact, uh, my mind goes back to another example that Bhagwan gives. Uh, the context in which he gives is that he says, we think that it is the object which is outside of us, which is actually the source of happiness. We really forget that the happiness lies within our own bosom, within our own mind, if we can say. So he gives this example of Bhagwan, you know, was pointing at his own car, the Mercedes, and he was saying, so do you think that the Mercedes it gives a lot of joy? And yeah, the tendency is to feel that uh, the Mercedes does give a lot of joy. And then Swami puts the next question. And what if the same Mercedes was parked in the neighbor's garage? (laughs) You know, and all of a sudden, 
that joy is not as much as it was now it's definitely a less a lot less <laughs> a lot less yes and i think maybe a, a little bit replaced even by jealousy, jealousy yes, yes. joy would have gone uh, yeah and then when you see the mercedes in maybe the showroom it increases even more you know the jealousy or you know the want for it so what bhagwan really is talking about here is is it the object which is the mercedes which is giving joy or is it our sense of ownership or our attachment to that which is actually giving us joy so it is actually the delusion that we feel that it's the object which gives us joy when the joy really you know exists in yeah, our mind yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. i remember uh, one senior brother telling me that we can never be happy until we realize that the center of happiness is not in outside objects and achievements but in ourselves for example if someone is um, desiring to have a cell phone and for some reason if his wish doesn't materialize he feels sad that is because the center of his happiness is in the cell phone mm-hmm. and not in himself right. and uh, and if you see the situation today many people especially youngsters they have their happiness centers so scattered all over the place especially on facebook twitter etc and you find you know they spend hours on end on playing video games on connecting with people collecting all kind of information most of which is trivial just so that they'll get some kind of happiness and eventually what happens is they get addicted to it yeah. in fact i just read somewhere that in south korea the problem is so serious that the government has declared internet addiction as a serious mental malady and oh there are God, clinics oh, and true. camps to look after this ailment in fact there's a very sad story of a couple who was so engrossed playing a video game that they forgot to look after their own infant my the baby actually died so that's how serious it is the point i am trying to say is this happens when we place our happiness center outside as swami says what you get outside is not peace peace is inside outside you get only pieces oh so this is just like the monkey mm. thinking that the happiness is coming from the nuts right yeah and it becomes a nut now we are all become nuts <laughs> oh, we all become nut <laughs> spending endless time on the social Finish. network well, what do you feel i feel that uh, the objective world has been purposely designed with its delusory attractions oh now one may ask why uh, don't you think the creator has deliberately made this world phenomenal and enigmatic with its own delusory charm so that the creation continues it is programmed that way but in his divine algorithm he has also put a decision box where one can choose to be played by maya or make a choice to play the maya now one has been given the choice to choose between his higher self which is centered in god or the lower self which is centered on body consciousness now here comes the tragedy of the mind it lacks the far sighted wisdom and patience to explore the unlimited joy of god which lurks within as amay brother pointed out We are too busy seeking joy from outside world. That reminds me of a beautiful analogy given by Sri Ram Krishna Paramahamsa. The grain dealer, as we all know, stores his rice in huge bags in the warehouse. He puts some puffed rice purposefully in a tray near them. This is just to keep the rats away. The puffed rice attracts the attention of the rats and they nibble at it throughout the night. They do not even seek the rice which are right next to them in tons. If we just think. one volume of rice can yield 14 unit volume of puffed rice how infinitely superior is the joy of god to the worldly pleasures <laughs> it's all about the choice that we make every moment okay nice. so ganesh uh, just to i mean uh, quickly get that part you're saying that the rat actually went to the puffed rice and i mean leaving out all that you know the bags of rice bags yes. of rice yes. yeah oh th- this really happens this, that, that's what happens because yeah. the puffed rice is kept open okay Yeah, so readily available. Ready ready ready. ready. What he's That's saying right. is possibly to puff price, even actually. the human being is something like that. But I really can't believe it. Why? Why is the mind like this, Giridha? Why do we still go, you know, behind this tinsel when there is something superior? Yeah, there is this uh, beautiful story that I'm reminded of uh, regarding the willingness to change, mm-hmm. you know, or to choose rightly, as Ganesh was pointing out. There was this man who suddenly started believing that he's a rat. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously yeah, there was problem at monkey and rats to this yeah that's right. probably there was uh, you know obviously there was enough problem at home because they used to find him more often behind furniture and below the couch and all that <laughs> uh, so they took him to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist did a beautiful thing which swami does to us all the time what he did was he put a mirror in front of him mm-hmm. made the man stand in front of the mirror and he also bought a cage in which a rat was kept 
So he showed him, see, this is you. This is a rat. So you are not a rat. You know, the mm-hmm. same way, like Swami says, I have come here to show you who you are. You know, you see your own reflection in me. And this, what you think you are are not really what you are. So a similar kind of thing. He was doing this exercise for a few days. Weeks passed by. Uh, the treatment was going well. And uh, suddenly the family found that, you know, he was free from this delusion. Uh, so they all came back with that man to the doctor to thank him. So what he did was, you know, they were speaking with each other and suddenly this man, during the conversation, hid under the table again. So the the psychiatrist was shocked and uh, he said, what's wrong with you now? He says, there is a cat on your wall. (laughs) So he said, I thought you were clear with the fact that you are not a rat any longer. He said, see, I know that I am not a rat. But does that cat know that I am not a rat? (laughs) So I think uh, all of us are something similar to that. Mm. Oh my, I mean, that's really very uh, profound if you think about that. And incidentally, if you see here, the whole story is about the monkey and Swami says the monkey mind. So incidentally, that's what it really means. The mind is like a monkey. Swami says not just a monkey, but like a monkey which is bitten by a scorpion and also drunk. Uh, So how do we get over this deluding aspect? And very closely related to that is this greed. Why is the monkey holding on to the peanuts? Is it attachment? And that's why I think the next message that comes up is, how do we develop this sense of detachment? Why are we so attached to the pleasures of the world that even the superior bliss that one gets from God uh, doesn't seem to attract us? Uh, You know, I remember Swami always used to say, yes, it is very, very tough to develop detachment. And therefore, once he gave a very beautiful analogy, he said, as a human being, you cannot really develop detachment. All you can do is get attached to God. Mm. And he gave Mm. the example of a seesaw. He said, when one side goes down, the other side goes up. So he said, the more you get attached to God, the more you get detached from the world. Mm. So So he's Swami-centric. That was mm. the Mm. mantra Mm. Swami gave us. In fact, Swami has given a a story regarding this. He says that uh, there was a king who had arranged a fair. And uh, he had given an open invitation to all his subjects, saying that they can come and pick up (laughs) any item of their choice. You know, everybody was going there and doing, picking up, you know, pieces of art, jewelry, weapons and all that. Mm-hmm. There's one particular person, a lady, who was looking at everything but not uh, picking up anything from the fair. So the king got, you know, uh, quite perplexed. And uh, he then went to this lady in a disguise and he asked, don't you like anything in this fair? Ask for anything, I'll give it to you. From the posture and the way the king presented himself, the lady knew that it was the king himself. So she said, oh, king. It's not that I don't like anything in your fair. They are all very beautiful, but I'm not interested in them. So the king knew that this particular lady was a wise lady. So he said, you ask for anything. I promise I'll give that to you. And you know what the lady chose? The lady chose the king himself. Mm -hmm. By that, not only did she get the king, but the entire kingdom and the little fair, which was also part of the kingdom. (laughs) I'm I'm reminded of the biblical (laughs) quote. Seek the kingdom of God and everything else shall be added <laughs> unto you. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Right. That's, that's, that's right. But you know, Giridhar, this is a wonderful story. This may sound simple, but it's not really easy. Because man in this world has many desires. You, know, you can't live without desires. And the way you can deal with desires is in three ways. You can either yield to them. And what happens when you yield to them is they only increase. It's like, you know, putting something in fire. Adding oil to the fire. Right. Mm. The fire only burns brightly. The second is you suppress. This helps only temporarily. And it actually backfires. For example, you know, sometimes we fast because the religion demands it or somebody asks us to do. And the moment the fast is over, we are waiting for it to (laughs) to (laughs) take revenge (laughs) almost. That's what is called spring effect. Yeah, spring spring effect. Spring effect. So it doesn't work actually. The third aspect, how we can deal with desires, is to sublimate the desires. You know, you replace it with something higher, something nobler. Actually, here I'm reminded of a very beautiful experience of one uh, former student of Swami's university, Gopal Indreshwar Singh. He is the scion of a royal family. And uh, over the course of an interview, he narrated this. What happened was, there was a person who had become a confidant of his grandmother. And uh, he was a very clever person. What he had done was, he had helped himself to many assets of the family. He had his way into the bank accounts of the family. And the elders in the family couldn't do much. 
and indreshar who was here studying he was really disturbed and he was helpless he wanted to do something one day he was sitting in darshan and only thing he could do was after the darshan was over he sat and he mentally started boxing this guy black and blue ruthlessly he was boxing him okay venting out his anger <laughs> swami suddenly opened his uh, interview room door and called him and said gopal what are you doing he said nothing swami what are you doing with kishore then gopal burst out swami you know you know what this guy is doing he's a evil man then swami said do you realize you have committed three murders oh he said what yeah you have killed him thrice then swami said in man's laws you commit a crime when you actually do the evil act physically mm-hmm. but in god's laws when you think about it you have already done the crime oh, and you have to face the karmic burden oh so he was like totally shocked <laughs> and he didn't know what to do he was begging uh, pardon and then swami said okay tell me gopal now what do you feel about kishore he said swami okay what i was doing was wrong but my feelings for kishore have not changed a bit yeah I mean he is an evil man. <laughs> <laughs> Then Swami said, "Okay, close your eyes now." Mm. And box him. Box him to your heart's content. Okay? So he started now given divine permission, he he was full, even more furious. Even more embold, emboldened yeah. to really square with him and so the fighting uh, started and it came to a point where they were on a cliff. And he gave a big blow and they were about to actually Kishore was about to tip off. the cliff okay and then swami suddenly appeared in that scene and swami told gopal can't you notice he told what do you see what kishore is carrying and and then when he noticed he saw in his arms there was a small baby a cute sweet loving smiling baby and he was so shocked he said no way i can allow this baby to die so immediately he jumps forward he embraces kishore and uh, to cut the story sh- short they are saved the baby is saved and uh, kishore is a transformed man he uh, he's so grateful to for saving his life now he wants to offer everything that he has to gopal and then gopal comes back to interview room swami taps him and he opens his eyes and swami says So did you learn your lesson? Swami says, the lesson is when you have hatred, what you have to do is to visualize an object or a thing which draws love out of you, and you ensure that this love engulfs the whole atmosphere. It engulfs even that person. That way, you ensure that you don't have the karmic burden, and that is the way we can see that our lower desires are replaced. you know his hatred was now replaced with love i think that is that is one way to deal with desires you replace it with something loftier something nobler yeah uh, vishu i like that word which you said you know replace or you know sublimate i think that was a word you used and often enough we also see this happening in parthi it happens to my parents and i'm sure it happens to all your parents too that they come over here they stay here for 10 days and during that 10 days they have no other engagements there is no television there is no newspaper there is no internet there is nothing to keep them busy or so called busy all the time the mind is focused on swami you need to go in the morning for darshan for bhajans in the evening again and there are some programs all the time the mind is focused and when you ask anybody they say these are the most peaceful 10 days of my life or a fortnight of my life so in fact bhagwan through this very unconscious act he is telling us that you sublimate move from your worldly desires so something that will you know which will make you sublime and eventually mm-hmm. you will find peace yeah right and you get a taste of it when so you are in party what is saying is detachment is not about giving up anything but yes. just replacing the lower desires with i think that like is as an easier way yeah. to do yeah, yeah. 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 choosing zombie probably yeah. in every moment of your life yes. Yes. but uh, there are also some deep sense of insecurity complex which is lurking within us which we may not be aware of and these are the things which bind us down we may bind ourselves with some current relationships there may be a belief there may be a lifestyle 
which we are sticking on to though it may be painful not letting it go ha uh, we are not letting it go though it is painful but still we are sticking on to it why so now swami says that now wisdom and renunciation are the two wings of a bird wisdom without renunciation is useless renunciation without wisdom is foolishness actually so in this regard swami says that most of the rich people in the society don't know what to do with the money they have they lack both wisdom and renunciation he compares them with a dog sitting on a top of a hay stack barking at the cattle who want to feed on the hay neither can the dog eat the hay nor does it allow the cattle to eat and satiate their hunger such is the predicament of society today really only swami can give such beautiful, beautiful examples beautiful. Yeah. now it is time that we do soul searching to find out the exact source of lasting happiness followed by a decision to give up old instinctive habits of greed and possessiveness we must know that true happiness lies in giving and not in grabbing and accumulating just as the monkey was trying to do exactly. in the story exactly exactly yeah in fact this is what brings me to the third profound message in the story which is a uh, check on desires right. if at all the monkey would have given up a few nuts why is it holding on to that and as ganesh rightly pointed out happiness truly lies in less desires as swami says who is the happiest man in the world yes. the one who has minimum desires right. he's the uh, richest man who is most content yes yes i remember general chibber uh, having given this formula for happiness he says happiness is equal to number of desires fulfilled divided by total number of desires entertained Mm-hmm. Now, either you increase the numerator or you decrease the denominator. denominator. Mm-hmm. But I guess all of you will agree with me that you do not have a control of how many desires can be fulfilled. Right? right? There are yeah. so it's a function of so many so things. Many. But we definitely have a say over reducing number of desires. Mm-hmm. So don't you think this story of the monkey and the pot and the nuts also tells us that man should have a check. Swami doesn't say no desires, but he says have a check on desires. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you feel, uh, Am I? In fact, yeah, I think you are absolutely right. I mean. If only the monkey would have held on to a little lesser number of nuts, maybe yeah, he would. It, he would, it have, would been have been able... happy and also not got caught. Yes, mm. it is only our greed, you know, our lack of feeling. Uh, Probably the monkey would have taken one nut at a time. Taking <laughs> <laughs> that's patience. That's patience. Smart solution. <laughs> smart solution. <laughs> yes. smart solution. Yes. In fact, Bhagwan, uh, through our uh, one of our very senior gentlemen uh, in our university, had given this message, which he told to me. He was saying, uh, often times we see, you know, this rat next to Ganesha. Oh, another rat story, yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Somehow, I guess the nature has many more, you know, lessons. lessons yeah, very true, very true. Uh, unfortunately, we have become dogs, cats, <laughs> and rats. These are hidden secrets. They are always hidden, right? Like rats. Hmm. So uh, he was saying that if you actually look at uh, the rat, what it does, it has a little bill of its own. It goes outside and picks up all sorts of tinsel and trash. Hmm. In fact, he said that if you were actually to open up a bill and find out, you will actually see all sorts of things, you know, captured inside: plastic, paper, cloth, batteries, food items, and you'll actually wonder: Does the rat really require it? And then the our sir went on to tell us: Bhagwan was saying the mind is exactly like that. We just go and keep collecting tinsel and trash from outside and keep dumping it inside. If we were actually were to open up our mind and see, we will have a whole, you know, gamut of absolutely unnecessary thing always clouding the mind. But then Bhagwan, you know, gives this, the, you know, the punchline. He says, "But if you were to look at the rat of Ganesha, he has a little modakam in his hand, with his eyes all the time fixed on the Lord's eyes." So Bhagwan compares that modakam to the wisdom. You mean the, the sweet ball in its hand? The sweet ball, yes, mm-hmm. the laddoor. And when its eyes are always fixed on the Lord's eyes, which is the master, or who is Vigneshwar, the remove of obstacles. When you keep the the master or the Lord in your mind and make him the master of your mind, all of a sudden you don't have anything but the fruit of wisdom in your hands. That's one. So mm-hmm. Bhagwan gives this kind of he. I mean, this is a way of uh, again, you know, in in a sense, you choose. You are limiting your choose yeah. and limiting and choosing. checking. Yes. So what we are basically doing is defining our needs and desire. That yeah. is very important. Where to draw the line? Where to draw the line? Now, to give an example that distinguishes need and desire, I am sure all of us have worn shoe at some point of time in our life. I am sure. When we buy a shoe, we make sure that our leg is exactly fitting inside the shoe. if the shoe is either big or smaller than the size of our leg we feel uncomfortable or painful isn't it now money should also be placed in the same way in our life you mean the desire so desire desire any any resources i mean yeah any resources yeah. too much causes unnecessary burden 
whereas living like a miser is also not advisable mm-hmm. right yes yeah in fact swami gives another a total different dimension to uh, ceiling on desires he doesn't say as you pointed out that have no desires but he says ceiling on desires means to simply not waste the existing resources right. as ganesh just pointed yes. out swami says do not waste food yes yeah do not so waste important. energy the times, five, yeah. Uh, yeah the five do not waste time see these are all simple things in life which contribute greatly uh, you know to uh, to our fulfilling our own desires mm. and actually just uh, i was just thinking of what ganesh said uh, the shoe example you know so you know how much uh, you should take as reminded of an anecdote that swami narrates of a person who did severe penance to propitiate uh, goddess lakshmi because he wanted wealth and uh, so the goddess was pleased and she appeared and asked this person i am very pleased with your devotion tell me what you want and this person was actually absolutely delighted because goddess had come ad- adorned with all jewels and that's what his eyes were on and uh, he said um goddess i want you i want you to come to my home so 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 she said definitely you have pleased me i will come to you i'll come to your home but on one condition you lead the way and i will follow you but you should never turn back the moment you turn back i will stop at that point and disappear okay so this person thought okay no problem you know she is anyway coming to my house and she and the goddess also promised when i come to your house i will give you all my ornaments okay so that's what happens the person led the way and as he was walking he heard this tinkling sound of the jewels and after a while he just couldn't resist himself because he was so tempted he wanted to see what the jewels were mm. and uh, so he thought okay for a moment i'll just turn by let me see what those jewels are mm. and the moment he did that the goddess stopped and disappeared so swami gives this example to show how this person he had got so much grace from god god had appeared but he didn't really make use of it he almost lost so much because he had this desire if he had only limited his desire he would have benefited so much same thing swami says i am here giving you so much but if you, if only we are prepared if only we make use of what he is giving there's so much that we can benefit yeah, from yeah these are those moments of truth you know there's one moment is enough to get lost in the world and this <laughs> god but uh, guys i think we are really getting into too much of heavy talk and people will say this is all preaching it's very nice on paper but uh, i guess we should come to more uh, practical terms now can we spend the next 5 minutes before we wind up on how exactly can we put all this into practice as swami says one ounce of practice is better than tons of preaching so right. come let's come to brass tacks and say how can i start doing this right now in my life today can you give mm. me some tips yes so swami tells us that desire is like a cobra snake that we are holding <clears throat> all the time thinking it to be a harmless rope until one day when it coils us completely into helplessness and bites us Now the perception of cobra at any moment should instantly make us drop the snake but when it comes to cigarettes or alcohols or drugs or even traits like short temper obsessive desires that can cause havoc in not only one's life but can literally destroy families we are apparently reluctant to give it away now it is because we do not see the potential yet imminent disaster that hides behind these habits if one goes to cancer hospital and sees a patient of lung cancer suffering with intolerable pain on account of serial smoking or go to a rehab center and see the alcoholics struggling to get out of the drinking habit who have ruined their families and done irreparable damage to their loved ones just because they had a weakness even one glimpse of such situation will be an eye opener to the ones who are in their early stage of thinking or feeling are feeling reluctant to give up these habits or traits But what if someone is not having such dramatic exposure in in their early stage of addiction, or uh, say they don't have opportunities to see the terminal stage of these problems? Well, Swami has given solution for that also. Once a devotee confessed to Swami that he was struggling with his bad thoughts and he was unable to get over them. Now he happened to hold a letter in his hand as he put forward his plea to Bhagwan. Bhagwan gestured for the letter and rolled it. He then gave back the letter to devotee and asked him to straighten it. the person straightened the letter but every time he left it it would roll back this happened 3 or 4 times mm. then swami took back the letter and rolled it in the reverse direction mm. and there it was the letter stood straight as before 
Then Swami remarked in his inimitable way that instead of working on our shortcomings, we must start or develop a new good habit. If we focus our energies in this way, then automatically the bad traits or activities of lower energies will shed on their own. Mm. Fantastic. Very beautiful. In fact, yeah, that will be a very dramatic way, in, in fact, of changing some of our bad habits. In fact, I am reminded of a very beautiful story from Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa's life. It seems there was a, this particular gentleman who used to have a very bad habit of taking in opium. And he came with a genuine request to Ramakrishna asking, Swami, how do I stop this? I have started it. I know its evil effects. How do I stop it? And Ramakrishna devised a very beautiful, very innovative kind of a method. He gave him a chalk piece and told him, you should have only that much opium as much as the chalk weighs. Oh. <laughs> so, fine. But what you should be doing is every day, write Om with this chalk. And then continue doing, that is weighing it and take that much. And so the, the particular gentleman was quite uh, surprised. What was the connection between writing an Om and actually taking an opium? But what he did not know was that very subconsciously, even as he was writing Om every day, the chalk was reducing, the weight was reducing, and so was the weight of the opium that he was taking in. Wow. So even on one side, when Bhagwan gives us the example of actually making a dramatic change to your habit, Bhagwan also says that we can actually reduce by making those gradual improvements, those step-by-step -step processes. That Slow and steady, but more permanent. Hmm. Make that one step ahead. Yeah. In fact, that is another. there is another very beautiful example of somebody asked, how am I able to uh, measure what is the level of spiritual progress that I have made? And the answer to that was that every time you move away from equilibrium, from your you know state of peacefulness, how much time does it actually take for you to come back to equilibrium? Hmm. That would be a good measure of how much spiritual progress you have made. For example, if I were to get angry and if I'm, you know, disturbed for an hour, with my spiritual progress, am I able to reduce it to like half an hour or 15 minutes? So that self-audit, that step-by-step -step movement towards perfection, I think that would be another way <clears throat> of actually overcoming greed. Yeah, actually you mentioned about self-audit, uh, Kame. I want to talk about another kind of self-audit that Swami talks about. He says, if we examine in our life, there are so many assets and positions that we have which we actually do not need. See, what happens more often than not is uh, we, we possess an object for some time and we use it for a while and then slowly we get attached to it and it becomes indispensable in our life. For example, you know, you take a cell phone. Ten years ago, none of us had cell phones. Okay, and now yeah, <laughs> cell phone has become uh, almost like an extended... <laughs> more organ. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It has become an extended limb of our body. Okay. Similarly, if you take uh, uh, so many assets that we have in, uh, in our homes, in our drawers, cupboards, etc., you will see that in most of it, we bought because we saw someone having it. We thought that if we, if we do not have that uh, object, then probably we'll... We will feel small in that in that company. You know, when I'm in, when I'm in, among the colleagues, I'll feel small. Or maybe I'm not in tune with times. So I need to buy this so that I... prestige issues. Yeah, all those issues. So we really don't need them. We buy it for other reasons. So Swami said we have to examine all those assets which are expensive, all those assets and habits which are expensive and and which are superfluous, and see how we can reduce them because that is very important. Not only materially because that will reduce our expenditure. It is also very useful spiritually. I think that is something which we can, you know, practice. Now. Yeah. So speaking about practice, I have a personal experience actually in this. Oh, uh, really? Once Swami had told us <laughs> that uh, coffee is bad for health. Oh, I've given it up so many times. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm coming to I that. Many <laughs> things relate to that. <laughs> so what did I do was I tried to negotiate with my mind. Okay. I said, okay, you will not drink coffee regularly because Swami has told it's bad for health. So I, I told my friends that I'm a social drinker of coffee. <laughs> that is, <laughs> if you would offer me coffee, I wouldn't say no. Okay. That was the first step I took. But I found that that did no good to me. Okay. So then I thought that I should be intelligent with myself. So I said, oh, mine, I'll not give you coffee. I'll give you cappuccino. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so which is like you know some amount of coffee, some amount of That's uh, the deluding chocolate. Aspect of the yeah, mind. that is the deluding aspect of the mind. Somehow the mind did believe for some time that it's a good idea. I'm not actually drinking coffee, <laughs> core coffee. Uh, so it went on for some time until recently I realized that when coffee was being served somewhere, oh my God, I couldn't resist. the smell of coffee you know the taste of coffee was coming back to me again and again mm. and that's when i realized that neither negotiation nor intelligent tactics mm. will work to give up desires yeah. Yeah. there needs to be a strong willingness mm. to change yeah i think that is very important uh, gear that, that you mentioned that we we should not ever compromise on whatever we decide to do for example there will be many you know who who would say that we will not see tv and they will start okay we, maybe we'll see only in the news and slowly it starts into other programs and you never get anywhere see one thing i realized is first i had this perspective that coffee is bad for health so i used to think i should not have coffee because it is bad for health even that perspective of you know just physical health being affected was not good enough when my mind started really thinking of a change is when i told myself it is more important for me to follow what swami told because it is his words than it is because it is my own physical well being because sometimes i tend to neglect my own physical well being but because swami told and it is more important to me that way my mind began to change That's so wonderful but i guess we have to really stop otherwise the audience will blame us of not having a ceiling on our discussion so let me now quickly sum up what all we have done we started with this wonderful story of the monkey the pot and the nuts the three messages that came out of this was one is the deluding aspect of mind one is the sense of being detached to the worldly pleasures and thirdly placing a check on one's desires and eventually when we came to brass tacks we said what are the practical tips Swami, the Democrat that he is, is so open and all inclusive. He has given us both options. One is a slow option, the example of the chalk and the meat, or the example of unrolling the paper and rolling it in the other direction. That is basically uh, replacing lower desires with nobler desires, or also the quick way, the way you leave a snake. The moment you know it's a snake, you immediately give up certain habits. Both are essential, or maybe optimal mix of both. But what you need is a strong will. And above all, I guess what I really liked from the discussion was to conduct a self audit. It's not about how much I have achieved, but Swami says, "Am I better than yesterday? Right. Am I better than last month?" So Swami really sees this marginal improvement that a human being is making, and not dramatic achievements, which he knows is tough for a being. So well, I guess we have learned a lot, at least the four of us, and I'm sure our audience will also uh, feel so that there is so much to learn just from a simple short story, Small short stories, stories and profound, profound lessons. lessons. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Amai uh, Ganesh Giridhar, and thank you, Bishu, for yeah. being with us. Thank yes, you. Yes, sir. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much, sir, uh, for moderating the session so deftly, and thank you to all research scholars for participating in this session. Dear listeners, this was an episode of our series Radio Sai Study Circle. we definitely enjoyed offering this to you but you know we would want to know what you feel about this program so please send in your mails generously to listener at radiosai.org every line you write will help us to know what you think and give us more ideas to plan such offerings we hope and pray to swami that we can serve you better this episode was recorded in the studio of radio sai in august 2010 to read the text of this program please visit heart to heart our e journal at hwsci.org thank you very much for your patient listening and sign up